So hello and welcome to everybody. I'm Jackie Petito. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Assistant Director of Portal, which is the Portrait Gallery Scholarly Center. Thank you so much for joining us for today's lecture, which features the latest research uh, by Dr. Melanie Harvey, Assistant Professor and Coordinator of Art History at Howard University. Dr. Harvey will present toward an African Methodist Episcopal aesthetic idol, Art and Images at Wilberforce University, 1863 to 1914. And we're so excited to hear from her today. Uh, the Q&A will be moderated by Dr. Martha S. Jones, the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. But before we begin, we would like to give a land acknowledgement. Although we are tuning in together today from different places, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home in these places today. We also recognize the inherent flaws of portraiture. Since this nation's founding, who is represented and how one is represented reflects the country's flaws as well as its strengths. The National Portrait Gallery strives to present a more complete narrative, one that acknowledges the history of slavery, racism, and inequality in the United States. We are so pleased to present today's event as a part of the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture. The Portrait Gallery acknowledges the recent passing of Daniel B. Greenberg, whose generosity and that of his wife, Susan, makes the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture possible. Um, some guidelines before we start. As I mentioned before, and for those of you just joining us, we hope that you'll use the chat to interact with one another, make comments about the presentation, and let us know where you're tuning in from. But please use the Q&A feature, which you'll see on your Zoom toolbar, to ask questions. So we will have a Q&A after the presentation. We want to make sure we get all your questions, so only put those in the Q&A feature. All right. So I will now introduce our guest today. Dr. Martha S. Jones is a Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. She is a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the story of American democracy. Dr. Jones is the author of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All which was selected as one of Time's 100 must read books for 2020. Her 2018 book, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America, was winner of the Organization of American Historians Liberty Legacy Award for Best Book in Civil Rights History, the American Historical Association Littleton Griswold Prize for Best Book in American Legal History, the American Society for Legal History John Philip Reed Book Award, for best book in Anglo-American legal history and the Baltimore City Historical Society Scholars Honor for 2020. Dr. Jones holds a PhD in history from Columbia University and a JD from the CUNY School of Law, which bestowed upon her the degree of Doctors of Law honoris causa in 2019. Dr. Jones will moderate our Q&A for this evening. We're so glad to have her here. She's also one of our advisors for Portal, which is the scholarly center that's hosting tonight's program. Dr. Melanie C. Harvey is Assistant Professor of Art History in the Department of Art at Howard University. She earned her bachelor's degree from Spelman College and pursued graduate study at Boston University, where she received her master's and PhD in American Art and Architectural History. In addition to serving as Coordinator of Art History, she has served as Programming Chair for the James A. Porter Colloquium on African American Art and Art of the African Diaspora at Howard University since 2016. She has published on architectural iconography in African-American art, Black arts movement artists, and eco-womenist art practices. In 2020 through 2021, Dr. Harvey was in residence as the Paul Mellon Guest Scholar at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art. She is currently writing her first book entitled Patterns of Permanence, African Methodist Episcopal Architecture and Visual Culture. Let us now turn to the lecture. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Melanie Harvey. 
Thank you so much for that introduction, Jackie. And as I begin to share my screen, I also want to thank the National Portrait Gallery and Portal for this uh, amazing opportunity to give really my first public lecture uh, from the book project that I'm currently working on. So let me share my screen and we will begin. So before I begin, I want to extend my gratitude to the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art, to former Dean Elizabeth Cropper, to current Dean Stephen Nelson, and Associate Deans Teresa O'Malley and Peter Lucart, who all worked hard to ensure I had the opportunity to develop this program at the Center. <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge the archivist at Wilberforce University, who generously answered my email queries at the height of the pandemic. My gratitude goes to the staff at Moreland Spingarn, Ms. Elbashir, who is retired, and Sonia Woods, who have been foundational in assisting me in accessing primary sources to develop this book. And lastly, I want to thank the leadership of the Chadwick A. Bozeman College of Fine Arts at Howard University, Dean Felicia Rashad, Associate Dean and Gallery Director Dr. Lisa Farrington, and her interim chair of the Department of Art, Mark Bartley, and Associate Professor Professors Gwendolyn Everett and Elka Stevens, who have all generously supported the development of this project over the past few years. In 1999, Richard J. Powell mobilized a host of art scholars, art administrators, and art institutions to produce a groundbreaking exhibition and publication to conserve a legacy, American art from historically Black colleges and universities. To conserve a legacy exists in the annals of art history as a charge to subsequent generations to mine art history and material culture of HBCUs. I have taken up this charge in my analysis of the art and images that visually defined Wilberforce University in Ohio from 1863 to the early decades of the 20th century. This research I will share with you today is a portion of a book chapter from my forthcoming book manuscript, Patterns of Permanence, African Methodist Episcopal Architecture and Visual Culture. Even though Wilberforce was founded by the predominantly white Methodist Episcopal denomination in 1855, with African Americans like AME Bishop Daniel Payne as founding board members, Bishop Payne purchased Wilberforce for the AME denomination for $10,000 in 1863 and swiftly transformed the institution to serve as a cultural base for Black formalist sensibilities rooted in uplift and cultural definition through the use and circulation of visual culture. In this presentation, I will argue that the development of art collections on the campus, the commitment to offering art courses to enhance aesthetic literacy, and the emphasis on image making practices through photography established Wilberforce University as an aesthetic ideal that directly influenced African American cultural production across the arts from the end of the Civil War to the turn of the 20th century. This presentation will begin by defining Black formalism and examining the role of naturalist and theological discourse in the practice of Black formalism. I will then turn to consider how both the collection and display of art, as well as early, early course offerings in art, augmented Black formalist sensibilities at Wilberforce. This presentation will conclude with an introduction to a relatively unknown Black photographer, Thomas Kennedy, who was commissioned to take photographs of Wilberforce for the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 in Chicago. His arrival to Wilberforce altered the campus as he set up a space to operate a photography studio. Furthermore, Kennedy's photography advanced HBCU iconography during the final years of the 19th century, providing a richer context for Francis Benjamin Johnston's 1899 Hampton Institute in images and Arthur P. Badeau's early 1900s images of Tuskegee Institute. 
Analysis of the AME denomination's enduring commitments um, to art provides the opportunity to expand the art historical narrative by introducing new aesthetic actors and participants. In the words of actress Viola Davis from her 2017 Ox Oscars acceptance speech for Best Supporting Actress, this project aims to quote, exhume those bodies, exhume those stories, the stories of the people who dreamed big and never saw those dreams to fruition, end quote. It is imperative that art scholars continue to contextualize and augment the standing canon of African-American art as it only represents a fraction of the aesthetic pr practitioners and traditions and contributions to, African, um, to, to, to American art. Black formalism is framed the cultural life of the AME church, evident across the social histories that unfolded across AME space. African-American studies scholar Imani Perry defines Black formalism with these words. I am arguing that the rituals of Black formalism that is the social graces rule and rules of engagement were not the property of the elite. Formalism was deeply rooted in the communities that black folks imagined and carefully crafted from the late 19th century through most of the 20th century and that continue in more modest form today. In particular, I'm interested in Black formalism as a part of the culture attached to institutions like schools, churches, and civic organizations. Appropri appropriately, given the Creole forms of Black life in the Americas, Black formalism included elements of European cultural forms, though in its constitution, it became something distinctly Black American. Black formalism then was not based upon hierarchical ideas of culture that marked some cultures more worthy than others. Rather, the distinctions were made about time and appropriateness. Although Black formalism was engaged in across the lines of socioeconomic class and education, the increased access to formal education and literacy and property that emerged in the postbellum period unquestionably aided the development development of Black formalism. AME institu educational institutions, as well as the network of churches, provided a space of autonomy where everyday life could be structured and value systems promoted. Moreover, these visual histories advance new narratives of art patronage as practiced by African-American communities. One of Wilberforce's most notable former students and advocates, Alberry Allison Whitman, who was recognized as the most prominent Black poet after Phyllis Wheatley and before Paul Luntz Dunbar, described the university with these words, quote, surrounded by beautiful farms and from the West looked down upon by a group of heavily wooded hills. It is one of the most desirable college sites in Ohio. The locality is eminently healthy, a considerable creek winding around the grounds to the southward drains the neighboring fields and gives the whole surrounding an admirable, neat aspect. A number of fine spring br springs break out in the deep ravines around the college, bubbling and laughing with lucid health sparkling in their faces. The campus is laid out on a beautiful plateau lying southeast of the university and covered by a splendid grove with here and there neat cottages among the trees. End quote. This description is consistent with some of the earliest images of Wilberforce across print and photography that represent the campus as an idyllic, picturesque environment. Under the auspices of the AME denomination and the direct influence of Bishop Payne, Wilberforce University was crafted into an aesthetic ideal and a beacon of of education for African Americans. The natural landscape and the familial cottage setting was the perfect primer for Bishop Payne to develop and promote a college culture rooted in liberal arts, domesticity, and African Methodism. Payne cultivated Wilberforce University and the surrounding areas as an idyllic setting, reflecting facets of idyllic sentimental poetry. Wilberforce was a pastoral setting that functioned as a metaphor for humanity prior to the development of culture. 
Art historian Matthew Bagel suggests that during the 19th century, there were three central positions on accessing and understanding God, quote, through scripture, through nature, and through a sense of God's eminence in the physical world, end quote. University, Bishop, or University President Bishop Daniel Payne and faculty developed curriculum to equip students to engage in this debate. For example, four years after the AME denomination purchased the school, the university catalog, the catalog advertised the first year of theological course of study as training in, quote, natural theology and the sacred classics, end quote. Theological studies at Wilberforce identified its mission in this context, quote, it is modern science that is modifying the views of this age in relation to theology. The modern infidel has seized upon the field of physical science and there must the modern theologian meet, fight and vanquish him in the name by the grace and for the glory of that God who made both nature and the Bible, end quote. The natural environment of Wilberforce provided an accessible object lesson for students that enhanced naturalist and theological aspects of the curriculum in Wilberforce's Black formalist tradition. Bishop Daniel Payne saw the potential in growing AM, the AME church to mobilize African Americans around education and African Methodism. In particular, Payne saw this as a means of elevating the intellectual acumen of AME clergy, which grew from 189 ministers in 1866 to 4,592 ministers in 1876. For Payne, African-American mastery of fine arts, as well as classical and naturalist discourses, advanced arguments for African-American equality and enhanced humanistic qualities throughout the race. But in the framework of Black formalism, these cultural vocabularies were transformed into visual affirmations of self-definition, emerging from a tradition of protest and agitation. At the conclusion of the Civil War, only two years after the initial purchase and months from the final payment on the property, the main building seen to the left of the college um, campus was set on fire by incendiaries. But by 1870, Wil Wilberforce occupied a significant place in the AME national landscape among AME members and Wilberforce University alum. <clears throat> Art was exhibited in several public spaces at Wilberforce, as well as in the domestic setting of the cottages on campus. In 1879, Reverend John Feathergill Waterhouse Ware, an ally of Bishop Payne, who served on the university's board of trustees, donated his collection of plasters from Paris to be on view in the art room to, quote, develop a taste and talent for the fine arts, end quote. For the 25th anniversary of the AME's purchase of Wilberforce, art was on full display across the campus. The denominational newspaper, The Christian Recorder, noted this contribution from Professor W.H. Seal, who described the art room with these words, quote, the art room was handsomely, handsomely decorated with drawings of teachers and students. Miss Maddie F. Roberts, the teacher, and Miss Ann H. Jones, the lady principal, are experts in this business. Their drawings are excellent. Mr. Fred T. Vinegar of Arkadelphia, Arkansas is trying hard to imitate the masters, end quote. Although the description is brief and somewhat vague in detailing the art on view, Seals does characterize a small community of faculty and students that were practicing artists. Outside of the art room, which served as the university gallery, the reception room, the lower chapel, and the music room were all, quote, well hung with pictures. After the death of Wilberforce pioneer Bishop Daniel Payne in 1893, AME documents reveal that Daniel Payne's art collection, which was on display in his home seen to uh, the right of the screen, the Evergreen Cottage, remained on the campus and was added to the university collection and on view alongside the plasters and drawings. <clears throat> 
Although archivists at Wilberforce University have not located an inventory of art donations um, or art on campus, we get a glimpse into what may have been in the collection from AME publications. Albert Boyne's 1993 analysis of Henry O. Tanner's genre paintings marshaled documentation from publications such as the Christian Recorder and suggested that artworks by Henry O. Tanner would have been deposited in Wilberforce's collection after 1893. It is also possible that one of Tanner's portrait busts of Payne may have been donated to Wilberforce as the busts were advertised for sale in the Christian Recorder. And finally, the catalog of American portraiture at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery contains a citation for an unlocated bust of Daniel A. Payne by Edmonia Lewis that dates from 1863 to 1864. Another significant artwork that remained on the campus of Wilberforce is a painting Elaine Lott misidentifies in his Negro in Art book as Robert S. Duncanson's only Negro subject painting, Bishop Payne and his family. In one of the earliest institutional histories of the denomination published in 1891, Bishop Payne introduced this painting as the result of his denominational fine arts competition of 1848 and 1849. Follow, following unanswered calls for, quote, the best piece of oil painting, end quote, from the church community, Payne decided to commission A.D. Wilson, a young member of Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia, to paint a portrait of his family. Weaving this art historical account into institutional history, Bishop Payne recalls, quote, there was, however, about this time in 1849, a youth by the name of Wilson, a son of a member of Bethel in Philadelphia, who had a gift in the direction of oil painting, but it was uncultivated. He was tolerably good in proportion, but defective in coloring and grouping. To young Wilson, Bishop Payne gave the commission for an oil painting to represent the parents of his first wife, Julia, and his two sisters, Caroline and Sarah B. Craft. Also two relatives, a lad of 17 and a girl of 14. In this painting, to which was added a portrait of an infant daughter, the figures were seen grouped in a garden attached to an to an old homestead, the old home of William B. Craft, the natural son of Charles Carroll of Carrollton. It is in existence and it is certainly a work of genius as it was made from life, all being original likenesses. No one can tell what eminence he, he might have attained had he been trained in some school of design and lived long enough to have his talents developed." End quote. Here Payne provides insight on an artwork regarded as a work of genius. He highlights an under an, an underrecognized artistic network that emerged from AME churches and documents art patronage and reception among African Americans. The case of A.D. Wilson stands as an early art historical chapter that, according to Albert Boyne, influenced Henry O. Tanner, the artistic luminary of the denomination. The family of Bishop Payne painting um, also conveys the significance of location in mid 19th century African American portraiture. According to Bishop Payne's account, this painting represents the family of Payne's first wife, Julia B. Craft Ferris, who died in 1849, shortly after childbirth. The inclusion of Bishop Payne among B. Craft's family documents a family unit he sought after his parents died around his 10th birthday. Considering Bishop Payne's loss of his first wife and newborn, this painting served as a memorial to his departed family, lost to death and geographically distanced by Payne's relocation to Wilberforce. Payne's identification of this setting as the estate of William B. Craft also reveals Payne's value of communal uplift and racial advance, advancement. William B. Craft was born to a free Black woman who was a leased laborer to the plantation owner Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who William B. Craft identified as his father. 
by, by 1806, B. Craft was one of the earliest African Americans to own a home, which you see in the painting, on P Street in Georgetown, Washington, D.C. The B. Craft family established a reputation as a prominent Catholic family, and in 1827, B. Craft's daughter, Anne Marie B. Craft, founded the first school for African American girls in the District of Columbia near Georgetown University. This portrait connected Wilberforce to a legacy of early 19th century educational traditions among African Americans. This painting, this painting provided students at Wilberforce with an example of generational wealth among African Americans that contributed to, ra to racial advancement. For contemporary art historians, this painting demands we further contextualize Black family imagery during the first half of the 19th century. This painting also provides an additional example of African-American domestic environments in DC beyond the often cited Negro life in the South by Eastman Johnson. Some viewers may have viewed Payne, the Payne B. Craft portrait, much like Bishop Payne, as a record of a familial past or as an ideal to strive for in the perilous circumstances of slavery. Does this painting signal an optimism among freed African Americans prior to the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850? Now, turning to art education at Wilberforce, as early as 1867, Wilberforce University advertised drawing classes. The normal school department incorporated linear drawing as an introduction to art, and the collegiate scientific course of study required geometrical drawing freshman year and perspective drawing sophomore year. But by the late 1880s, Wilberforce hired Maddie F. Roberts, an AME member and an educator from Virginia as instructor in music and art. Although Roberts graduated from Michigan's Conservatory of Music specializing in piano forte performance, the AME Church promoted her visual art skills. With her arrival, art courses expanded to include industrial drawing, painting, um, courses and a primary model course that would introduce future teachers to drawing and clay modeling techniques. Maddie F. Roberts offered classes in oil painting as well as drawing with crayon. In fact, in November 1887, in the Christian Recorder, the educational notes section announced her arrival stating, her talents are of high order. All who have recently visited the home of Dr. Arnett will recall the very fine portrait and crayon executed by her hand. She is finished for the gallery of the university portraits of Bishop J.A. Shorter and Dr. J.G. Mitchell, two of the three founders of the institution, and is now preparing a portrait of Bishop Payne. A professional German artist from Springfield, Ohio, has filled several orders at Wilberforce, but his work will not compare with that done by Miss Roberts. And this, I have not found many images, but I think this is actually a, a blurry reproduction of her image of uh, Dr. Arnett. The denominational leaders of African Methodism act, acted as art patrons, advancing the visual, visual art opportunities for Wilberforce faculty. Wilberforce annual reports from the period advertised the portrait services of art instructor Maddie F. Roberts, requiring customers to mail in a photograph and fee. Because I have conducted the majority of this research during the COVID pandemic, I have not been able to locate and confirm if Robert's portrait still exists, but it is important to recognize how AME discourse documents African American art production from those figures that we have not fully recovered from the archive. By the 1890s, AME bishops circulated images of Wilberforce as evidence of racial cultural advancement and self-determination. A little over a week before the opening of the World's Columbian Exposition, the Christian Recorder announced the following. Bishop Arnett has presented to the Commissioner of Education the photographs of professors, students and buildings of Wilberforce to be placed among the educational exhibits at the government building at the World's Fair, end quote. The university annual report 
for the 1893-1894 academic year, reproduced some of the photographs that were on view in Chicago and identified the photographer as Thomas Kennedy. Kennedy was born in 1862 in Washington County, Ohio, in the southeastern region of the state. His obituary states, quote, early in his life, he went into, into, into the photography business in Delaware, end quote. While in Delaware, he married Nellie, Nellie Madison, who was described as the daughter of AME pioneers in the state. Seven years after this marriage, he attracted the attention of AME leadership and was commissioned to photograph Wilberforce University for the World's Columbian Exposition. Although it's unclear how many photographs of Wilberforce were included in the exhibit, his obituary documented he captured, quote, a large number of pictures, end quote, for the initial commission. The university catalog for the 1893-1894 academic year described Kennedy's presence on Wilberforce's campus with these words, quote, as an expert photographer with a fully equipped gallery located on the university campus, an opportunity for special instruction in this art may be secured by addressing Mr. Thomas Kennedy, end quote. The appearance of photographs in the university catalog from the early 1890s marks a visual development from previously from previous university publications, introducing new technology and representation and expanding the amount of images of Wilberforce. Two photographs included among institutional information feature the two largest buildings on campus, the main building later referred to as University Hall and Ladies Industrial and Normal Hall. The photograph of the main building represents the campus as nestled in a wooded area defined by imposing structures. The main structure was rebuilt during the presidency of Bishop Payne after the incident of arson. So this photograph would have conveyed ideas of resilience of the institution. The interior photographs of both buildings were included to visualize the culture and cultural environment. For instance, the ladies hall reception room is furnished with spaces for study and parlor social dynamics. The framed class photographs leaning against the right side of the room indicate the enduring role of photography in the institutional history of Wilberforce. But perhaps for me most exciting, the interior photograph of the main building documents one of the highly advertised resources of the institution, the Natural History Museum. The museum was the result of faculty member Sarah C. Beers, later Sarah Scarborough, advocating for a collection to aid science instruction. In addition to donations from Rochester-based naturalist Henry A. Ward, Bishop Payne fundraised to match the initial donation and the museum was opened in 1878. Kennedy documents the light bathed room located on the fourth floor right wing of the main building lined with display cases containing botanical, mineralogical, geological, and zoological collections. In addition to the elk and buffalo, there appears to be a landscape painting or lithograph above the animal husk emerging from the window niche. The two, group the two group portraits reproduced in the early 1890s catalog pro project projects the balance between industrial and classical educational models. This image of student musicians provides insight into the Kennedy studio space fit with a painted backdrop and a textured rug. This photograph reflects more compositional similarities with the style of Kennedy's contemporary Atlanta-based photographer Thomas Askew and earlier photographic portraits of HBCU students like the iconic 1872 photograph of the Fist Jubilee Singers by Boston photographer James Wallace Black. Kennedy also photographed carpentry students seemingly interrupted during a lesson seven years before Francis Benjamin Johnston's photographs of industrial education at Tuskegee Institute and Hampton Institute. Kennedy remained at Wilberforce University completing a course of study between 1894 and 1900, and he continued photography through the early 19 teens when he decided to pursue a career in the newspaper business. 
So as I wind down, it's important to know that these photographs that Kennedy reproduced were included in numerous AME publications all the way um, in the early 20th century through the 1940s. I mean, 19, um, 1914, rather. Wilberforce University continued to be an aesthetic haven for artists in the 20th century. One interesting example is the case of James V. Herring and his summer teaching experience at Wilberforce in 1914. The annual report for this year also noted an exhibition of Herring's art was on view in the art room and several compositions were collected by local patrons. Considering Herring would go on to found Howard's Department of Art in the following decade, it's interesting to consider how the visual arts at Wilberforce may have impacted his vision for art at Howard during the 1920s. The AME Church and other historic African American institutions preserve art and architectural histories that remain in need of historic preservation and scholarly interpretation. This analysis has demonstrated how the AME denomination developed a Black formalist practice across art, placemaking practices, and the circulation of visual culture rooted in 19th, rooted in 19th century strategies of self-definition at Wilberforce University. This denomination mobilized to create a record of racial advancement and patterns of permanence to document the diversity of experiences is present in this religious community. It's my intention to provide an aesthetic and visual culture history of the AME church. So when AME images appear in the archive of artists, we better understand the religio, social, political, economic, and aesthetic facets of the African American of the African American communities that these artists emerge from. Thank you for your time and attention, and I'm looking forward to receiving questions. Well, good afternoon. Hi, and Dr. Jones. You, hi, Dr. Harvey. Thank you so much um, for this remarkable presentation. Um, you know, you mentioned um, in your talk um, the conditions under which you've been working. Um, and I think I'm not alone in saying this was really uh, such a rich and um, really um, delicious uh, visit to some remarkable archives that, and so we're deeply grateful to you um, for the introduction to these materials, um, but um, for the analysis. Um, lots of appreciation going on in the chat, um, but my task is to um, share with you some of the questions that are coming. And I encourage folks to drop their questions in the uh, Q&A function here on Zoom, and we'll hope to get to as many of them as we can. Um, I guess I'll start um, with an anonymous question um, that goes, uh, what did the AME Church and its institutions see as the connection between its faith and the artistic engagement that your talk and your forthcoming book document. Um, I, I think there's a way in which um, uh, sometimes um, we treat black churches as interchangeable with other um, political and cultural institutions. Um, but my sense too is that there's something specific about this faith community that we're learning. Um, could you say a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, for me, I think I really came to this subject um, when I really kind of started to interrogate James A. Porter's modern Negro art. And I realized that he included in the, that foundational, you know, initial um, art history of African-American art, he includes a portrait of Bishop, um, the founding Bishop of the AME Church, um, uh, Richard Allen, that he commissioned when he was was at the Christmas um, Christmas Methodist Conference, which is the first conference of Methodism in the United States. So for me, that was like my first clue in that 
as this community is emerging, art is there along the way the whole entire time. And it does not cease. It extends literally from this first pastel portrait that was uh, rendered, I believe, in uh, 17, in the 1780s. And, and it extends all the way uh, into really the 20th century. Um, so I think that very early on, when we even look at those early founders of African Methodism and their direct engagement engagement with um, protest culture and advocating for civil rights in the late 18th century, they understand that image matters, that representation matters, and that this becomes a charge, really, uh, of the denomination. I would even say um, the early work of the founders would even give the congregation the courage to even in the early 20th century begin to imagine Christ and Madonna as Black. Mm. You know, it's in an AME church in Chicago, Quinn Chapel, that you have the first kind of rendering that we know of in America of, of, a, of a Black Madonna and child. So um, for me, from the founding of African Methodism through to... Um, really the 20th century, you see an importance. And I would also argue that, you know, the, the work that representation was doing was so important because at the same time, you have Euro, Euro white artists who are representing the Methodists in a negative way, you know? So there's this very clear kind of visual um, discourse back and forth about representation and the AMEs are persistent in representing themselves with kind of dignity and very much so capitulation relating to um, respectability politics. Yeah, so I mean, Black um, churches, church communities, and spiritual practices are being caricatured in this period, cruelly, um, misleadingly caricatured. Um, and so I love that sort of framing of this as a, as a debate, as a contest. Um, and um, I also think one of the key takeaways for me is this notion of permanence, right? What does it mean not only to establish a congregation, to establish a denomination, but to signal both within and without that you're permanent? I've written a little bit about church edifices, right? The structures, the buildings, right? As one claim, but you've really added something I think important um, and new for us. Um, a question from uh, Mary Beth Matthews um, also was something I was thinking about. She asked, did Professor Harvey find any photographs of Elizabeth Keckley? And I would just expand on that to say that when you showed us that 1914 portrait of faculty and students, oh, my, my jaw dropped and I wanted to blow it up and begin to see if we couldn't take it apart and recognize folks. And so could you say something about not only who you find, but maybe a little bit about your method in that regard, because yeah. it's not as straightforward as it seems, I don't think, to it, it, um, it is an, and, individuals. And I would say it really, it, I guess it's the gift and the curse of the pandemic that I was really forced to lean on a lot of um, digitized archives. So Princeton had a lot of things digitized um, and just really going through the images and, and the pictures. Now, what's quite interesting is I actually have not come across images of Elizabeth Keckley, but um, given the work of one of my dear colleagues, Aston Gonzalez, we know the role that Elizabeth Keckley played. I mean, he one of the great revelations, I think, from his book that I hadn't noticed is that, you know, um, I think it's one of the suits of Lincoln that she actually mails, you know, has sent to Wilberforce, and it becomes a kind of um, archive, archival site, really, for African uh, Americans. And so, um, but let me jump back and maybe even and use this as a way to talk about Maddie F. Roberts. I saw mm. her name. I saw her name. And I'm like, oh, I, ha I have to know more about this woman. And then once I went through the faculty, pre the faculty photographs and did a little um, process of elimination to put a face uh, with that name of a woman who, you know, is in the 1880s, 
engaging in art instruction. And one thing I really couldn't get to because of time, she also writes essays for the Christian recorder about womanhood. So her art practice is very much so engaged with her redefining in a new way what Black womanhood is. And I mean, that that is an amazing story because for the most part in terms of art history, art history, we really begin to dive into African-American art instruction in the 19th, in, in the 20th century. We, we have not, I don't think, done the due diligence of saying, well, who was doing the art instruction in, in the 19th century? And so to find and be able to put a, a face and words to the life of Maddie Roberts, to me, is one of just the richest gifts that I received during this chapter. And again, it only comes from institutions like Princeton, like Emory, um, digitizing these AME records. Mm -hmm. Uh, so folks are really interested in your process. So um, I'm going to see if we can dive in a little. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, Miguel de Baca asks, um, were there things in the archives that you couldn't discover? Um, things that may have um, shaped the trajectory of, of your work? Well, yes. Um, and again, a lot of it comes to, comes from me not being able to get to Will before. So not being able to say, yes, this is a drawing, you know, by Maddie F. Roberts or Annie Jones. Um, also, because because there was no art major per se, it's hard to really put a number on how many students would have actually received art education training and to what extent. Um, and then I will say, you know, Wilberforce in some of the uh, educational histories about Wilberforce, they, 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 they frame Wilberforce as being this kind of target, um, essentially for, um, you know, efforts to undermine Black education. And so some of the educational shifts that happens with Wilberforce, like them removing theological um, training and founding Payne Seminary in the 1890s and emphasizing more industrial education in the early 20th century also made it more difficult for me to track just how how um, the extent to which arts had really permeated um, the curriculum. But to find, again, that James Herring, who goes on to found Howard's art department, spent time there. To me, that was just a good compliment in some ways, even to the narrative that we get from Du Bois, right? Where he's very kind of, he, he, he gets the opportunity to come to Wilberforce, but then realizes all the flaws and the politics um, that were at play on the campus. And so so I, 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 I don't know how, but I'm going to look as hard as I can to see if I can get closer to what James Herring's um, experience would have been. And I'm, I'm very open to whether it's positive or negative. Maybe you say this is not, you know, maybe we need something more structured for African-American art education. But the idea that he exhibited his work and he would have encountered that gallery space speaks volumes in terms of where Howard will go in terms of his art collection practices. Yeah. Um, folks are very interested in, um, I think, the experience of students and the Wilberforce community. Um, but thinking about this in part in um, terms of hierarchy, you know, as I was listening, I was thinking um, about the way I think you're, you're really challenging a, a framework that I brought to this talk, which was the politics of respectability. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. But Bonnie Barber asks um, more directly, were the students at the university from a higher socioeconomic level in that they came from families that had appreciation for the arts? And Christopher Capazzola asks if this engagement with the arts was in part um, a way of claiming space or challenging hierarchies mm -hmm. in art making at the turn of the century. So I think we have this sense that there's some kind of equation um, between um, social and economic status, um, mm -hmm. racial hierarchies, um, and how the fine arts really fit into mm -hmm. that equation. Um, yeah. 
Um, well, I, I think I would probably side more with the, the latter statement um, that I think it's a way of claiming space and kind of subverting some hierarchies. And I think it kind of also goes back to Imani Perry's suggestion that Black formalism is working across socioeconomic boundaries at, at the time. And I think a really good example um, is the poet that I mentioned, um, Allery Alson Whitman, who was a formally enslaved person found their way to Wilberforce for education and was able to rise to be the most prominent African-American poet, you know, of his era. So I, I, I really see um, Wilberforce as serving that early, um, that early kind of site of as long as you can make it here for education, um, we will lift you up with that education. And, uh, and not just a purely industrial education, right, that um, you may learn how to build houses, but you'll also gain an appreciation for sentimental poetry and naturalist discourse. I mean, what's quite interesting, too, is I did this, I did this research around the time that um, the major uh, exhibition of Humboldt was up at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It was Humboldt Art, Nature, and Culture. And I was very taken aback by the exhibition in terms of the way in which African-Americans were purely relegated to being subjects in paintings of plantations, especially when we look through the Christian recorder and find that there are, a, I was able to find at least 30 mentions of, hum, of Humboldt and his kind of scientific discourse that African Americans are engaging with in in a public realm in writing and so it it just I it, it just to me makes even more relevant my research and its contribution to American art that we have to be more inclusive and expansive in how we describe um, you know art movements such as naturalist art and landscape art. Um, one question asks us about Frederick Douglass, and I, I'm going to take a stab at this question. Well, the, the question is, did, um, was Douglass affiliated with the AME Church? I think the story is he's actually affiliated with the AME Zion Church, um, in one of the first places Douglass um, preaches. But I, I also wanted to ask you to um, help us use Douglass as an, an entry into this story, because I think of Douglass as you know, one of the most profound commentators, particularly on photography, um, early in the advent of the technology, he's, um, he's photographed frequently, but very self-consciously. Um, and I think, I think, I don't know what you think, I think of Douglas as a kind of skeptic about photography and, and, mm. and, and, and offering up a kind of cautionary tale, right, yeah. about the ways in which images can be used and misused. And so, do you have a sense of how Douglas's ideas are resonating or is there a kind of confidence maybe at Wilberforce that Black Americans can indeed um, control and define the ways in which these images are not only produced, but used and circulated? I think there's a confidence because what's quite interesting, one of uh, Frederick Douglass's dear friends was the AME Bishop uh, Henry McNeil Turner, who uh, photographed himself very consciously with his children. And those photographs uh, live at um, Moreland Spengarn Research Center. Also, Frederick Douglass was um, in contact with in conversation with Bishop Daniel Payne. Um, in fact, there, and I, I, I can't, I can't confirm the location, but I have found online a photograph of Frederick Douglass, uh, Bishop Daniel Payne, and Dr. Um, uh, Benjamin Arnett, who was also a leader at Wilberforce. And I think this photograph might have been taken at the World Columbian Exposition. Um, but I, I think that there's very much so a confidence that that Douglas and those around him have, and they're all pushing uh, photography to, to the limits in terms of documenting themselves. And also thinking about, um, you, you are correct that he was trained as a, a, a minister in the AME Zion Church, but uh, one of the other chapters of my book actually looks at Metropolitan AME Church here in Washington, DC, which is kind of termed the, the Cathedral of African 
Methodism. And he is a dear friend of that congregation, so much so when um, they dedicate their new um, sanctuary in 1886, he gifts them these beautiful golden candelabras that the church still has in their possession, right? Um, and they have, I think, uh, one of his birthday parties is held there as well. And he, his let me get this right. His grandson photographed Metropolitan, um, and that image is in um, Cedar Hill. So there's like a very, a very kind of one-to-one -one relationship that Frederick Douglass has with the AME Church, and we know that because of photography. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I can't believe how quickly our time has gone, but um, if I could just um, ask one more question before we wrap up, and it, and it is, could you just um, help us um, situate um, this chapter, if you will, in the larger project? Because if I'm not mistaken, um, you are also interested in sort of material culture, um, yes. architecture and more. Um, yes. So um, give us a, 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 a preview, if you will, of the, sure. the whole of the book project. We would sure. So um, the, the kind of first case, because it really is more case study based, the first case study uh, will begin by thinking about um, portraiture and Richard Allen and the fa what I'm calling the founding generation. So, um, I mean, because what's so interesting about that first pastel portrait, and that actually is also housed at Moreland Spingarn um, in, in, uh, at Howard University. That portrait, I mean, just the, the history of where that portrait travels is quite impressive. Um, the subsequent AME bishops hold on to that portrait, and eventually it finds its way to Bishop Benjamin Tucker Tanner, who is the father of Henry O. Tanner. He gives it to his son, Henry O. Tanner, so it lives in Paris for some time, and it's it's given back to James A. Porter, who brings it back to Howard University. So, I mean, I'll be diving into that, the kind of travel, the many miles that that portrait has traveled, but also thinking about the interventions that Black women made in making sure that they were visible for the record, the images of his wife, Sarah Allen, as well as um, Jarena Lee those images uh, become very important. And I'm also interested in some of those frontier founders um, who we have photographs of. Um, and so really incorporating, balancing out the emphasis on the male representation with these women pioneers that made sure that their image was represented uh, for the record. Um, the second chapter we'll look at, will before which you've heard. And then the third chapter shifts, shifts gears to look at Metropolitan AME Church. Um, a, a strong Structure that again, the AME Church commissions a white architect to design for them. So they're they're making a very clear statement that the um, the wealth that we've amassed um, allows us to you know commission a white architect and be the boss of the white architect. Uh, and this is during the 1880s. And I will use Metropolitan really as a launching point um, to discuss what I'm thinking of as a building boom across the denomination of these large cathedral-like structures in American urban centers that, that in some ways can culminate with uh, the completion of Big Bethel. I mean, even that name, Big Bethel, right, in Atlanta, Georgia in 1923. Um, in the last chapter, which thankful to, you, thankful to your research, I'm really thinking about um, publications, AME publications, and the way that visual culture circulated in, um, in um, publications that were produced by AMEs like um, Hallie, Quinn, Hallie Quinn Brown, as well as the architect uh, John Langford. So, so that's kind of the, the shape of the beast. It's tremendous, Dr. Harvey. And um, we thank you for this deep dive into some really extraordinary materials. Um, and we look forward um, to um, hearing more from you about this book and um, its full scope. Um, so thank you so much for being with us. I think my task is to hand things back over to Jackie Petito um, from the National uh, Portrait Gallery. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you both so much, Dr. Harvey and Dr. Jones, uh, for this really insightful conversation and presentation. And I know we have a lot of questions, I will be sending Dr. Harvey and Dr. Jones the Q&A report so they will have your questions. 
But thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening. And before we do wrap up, I would like to invite you all back with us again on Tuesday, November 16th at 5 p.m. via Zoom. We will have our another Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture titled Oak Flat, A Fight for Sacred Land in the American West with author Lauren Redness. And you can go ahead and sign up for that on our website at npg as a national portrait gallery dot si dot edu slash portal and go to the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum tab there. But again, thank you so much everyone for joining us. We hope to see you next time. And thank you again, Dr. Jones and Dr. Harvey. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. <laughs>